a green energy company, mainly growing miscanthus. Bill tells the story of his experiences in growing and selling the crop. The programme also features Barry Caslin, energy and rural development specialist with Chagask. days as farmers look to diversify from the traditional ways of using land, their focus could turn to alternatives such as growing energy crops. Barry Caslin is Chagask Energy and Rural Development Specialist and I begin by asking him what are energy crops? Well, energy crops mean different things to different people. Energy crops could be growing a crop of uh, oilseed rape and producing rapeseed oil which could be used to produce biodiesel or pure plant oil. You could be using a crop of wheat or a crop of sugar beet and using it to produce ethanol, which is a replacement for petrol. So they're all what you would classify as energy crops meeting the renewable transport fuel requirements. But then on the other side, you have the heat targets that we have to achieve. So there are energy crops out there that can be used to produce renewable heat or even renewable electricity. So it would be purpose-grown crops such as willow, miscanthus, it could be crops like reed canary grass, um, Asian grasses, strong grasses as well that could be used for combustion as well. That could be um, baled and put into combustion zones and boilers to produce renewable heat. In Ireland at the moment, the growing of crops for renewable transport fuels is not commercially viable. Heat and electricity producing crops have been successfully grown to date. What has been popular in the last couple of years has been growing crops like willow and miscanthus, which is funded through the bioenergy scheme by the Department of Agriculture. And we ended up with 1,000 hectares of willow being planted since 2007. That grant had finished actually back in 2011, so we have had no planting there for a long number of years of these energy crops. We had around 3,000 hectares of miscanthus. Much of that has been taken out in the last number of years. I suppose due primarily to the fact that farmers planted in anticipation of market development, but the markets didn't develop at the pace that they had expected. One farmer who has been left disappointed by the absence of a market for his miscanthus is Bill Madigan from Wine Gap in County Kilkenny. I meet him in his shed, full of baled miscanthus that nobody is buying. The biomass business never happened. I mean, we hear all the time about opportunities for farmers to grow biomass and that. Here's a shed full of it. I have another shed down in the other farm full of it. And apart from the last customer I had was a woman coming for some to to bed five organic hens, you know. And I've been a long time using up the full of this bed and five hens. But Bill did have a market for Miss Canvas at one stage. He got into growing in 2008 and founded the company Kilogen, a Kilkenny company for Kilkenny farmers, to grow Miss Canvas. Their buyer was Bordnamona. Bordnamona were burning a million tonnes of peat in their plant in Eden Derry. Mm. And they said that they would maybe go to 5% miscanthus. Um, they told us they'd never go beyond 5% miscanthus because miscanthus is high in chlorine. And when you mix it with the peat for chemical reasons, they'd never go beyond 5%. Mm. Uh, so we contracted to supply them with 5,000 tonnes. Um, per annum and we said this would be a nice start for the company and then hopefully we would get other buyers Uh, people put in boilers and heating system for agricultural use or at the time we thought maybe the hospital in Kilkenny or something like that might take it on Mm -hmm. but none of that happened None of that happened and the contract with Bordnamona wasn't renewed The reason was that they said we didn't have enough biomass, we didn't have enough miscanthus to make it worth their while in actual fact between the other companies we were Kilogen but then uh, other farmers in other localities in Tipperary they formed a group called Tipgen and in Wexford they formed a group called Wexgen mm-hmm. so we had Midgen and Swegen and Legen and so on so like it was quite a bit of business being done yeah. and we were up to about 15,000 tonnes in total in the country with Quinns and Balton Glass and so on Joe Hogan and other growers but it still wasn't enough for Eden Derry to be interested they said you want a hundred thousand tons minimum but we couldn't grow hundred thousand tons if they cancelled the contracts we had and the reason they said was they'd have to make alterations to the plant to handle miscanthus if they were to go up in the percentages um, because of the chlorine and it wouldn't pay him to make the adjustments and also 
there was the difficulty that if they made any alterations to the plant or many, made any alterations to the feedstock, they'd have to go back into planning. And as we know, they have difficulties with Antashka. And since then, the Shannon Bridge plant has been closed down, even though they had decided to go 100% biomass. Um, reason being is they couldn't get enough biomass locally, so they were buying their biomass in Australia. And Antashka decided this is ridiculous, you know. Um, bringing biomass from Australia didn't seem to be very environmentally friendly um, and sustainable. Yeah. So the, it's closed at the moment. They're not burning peat or biomass. But Eden Dairy is still open and it now uses 30% biomass to 70% peat to generate electricity. But Irish Miscanthus doesn't form part of the biomass mix. They had to at least be 30% biomass. Mm. And they've managed to do that. Like, they've done a deal with Quilcha and they get a good bit from Quilcha. But, like, when we were going in with the Miscantas, you know, the truck behind us had be coming from Spain with, with wood chip and the truck behind that would be coming from Indonesia with palm kernel and stuff, you know. Um, and there was a difficulty in that it's grant-aided in the sense that um, it was called Renewable Heat Feed-In Tariff Refit, um, but it was a European-wide subsidy. So they weren't able to ring-fence it to me or us in Kilkenny, even though we were near. So if they could buy in Spain um, cheaper and ship it from Spain, which you could send a shipload of it in from Spain, obviously very cheap, and rail it or or truck it down from Dublin. Um, If they were able to buy it cheaper, they still got the renewable heat incentive from the government. And the difference was, like, if they got a load of miscandus, they might get a thousand euros of a subsidy on it, but they'd get two and a half thousand euros of a subsidy on the the truckload from Spain because it was dry wood ship and it had a higher energy density. So Uh that didn't produce any incentive to take it from us either so everything went wrong in the business because he has no market for his crop now he ploughed up 100 acres of it and left 50 acres in the ground in a wait and see attitude we took a decision to stay in business until 2020 because of the Kyoto Agreement and Ireland is going to exceed its Kyoto targets uh, for, for carbon in um, 2020. Mm. So um, we thought maybe we'd hold out and see because the fines are going to be substantial. I think they're in hundreds of millions, um, depending on who you talk to. It's an awful mess. And according to Barry Caslin, we are the worst in Europe in terms of renewable energy. We're really the laggards in Europe in terms of meeting our uh, renewable heat, transport fuel targets and renewable el- electricity targets. We won't meet our targets for 2020. We know that already. And this was that's due to the fact that we didn't really have the policies in place to create the demand for the likes of willow and miscanthus for pulp oil from forestry, get those biomass boilers in, because biomass is going to be a major contributor to our renewable targets. Based on SCAI, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, their scenario analysis indicates that 50% of our renewables are, are going to be, our renewable targets are going to be achieved through biomass. So that's, that means farmer involvement. So that means farmers have to be convinced themselves that this makes sense for them to grow biomass, whether that's pulp oil from forestry, whether it's an energy crop. And I, I think that confidence needs to, I suppose, be supported and nurtured. And Barry is hopeful, what with the new scheme that was introduced in June 2019, that energy crop growing in Ireland will resurrect. I think with recent policy developments in terms of the support scheme for renewable heat, we will see more willow being grown in the future for heat markets and miscanthus going into the heat markets as well. And of course, a byproduct of cereal production is straw from whether it's wheat and straw, barley straw or oat and straw. And there's a great opportunity of using that straw as a heat feedstock in the the future as well. Bill Madigan and other miscanthus growers won't be a part of that future though. We had originally something like um, 40 growers in eight companies. Now we have six growers in one company. So it's over. Like the biomass business has died to death. It, it'll never be revived again because the, the early uptakers like me that got into it will not be into it again. 
and after the burning anybody that had in Miss Cantus and the roast we got, I don't think anybody's going to touch Miss Cantus. And the willow is no better. Um, there was contracts for willow and Eden Terry would still take willow. Yes, there's no chlorine problem with willow, but the price isn't satisfactory because I get calls all the time from guys that have willow to know can we take the willow. And we've taken willow. Um, Killigen used to take willow even from the like of... Um, uh, the agricultural colleges, Kildalton, like we used to buy the willow and buy the um, miscanthus from the colleges, our oak park, the same way. They had no market for it, so the only bit of market was in it was through Kildalton, and largely that was going into Eden Dairy. So it's over, finished, done and dusted, end of. I think a considerable amount of knowledge has been gained from farmers who adapted energy crops in the last number of years, and Bill will be an example of that, who, um, you know, grew the crop, and very often early adopters are those that are, you know, get burnt because maybe they're there too early, and that's a very unfortunate thing because I think that, you know, a lot of knowledge has been gained there. Ireland's soil and climate is very suitable in many ways for growing energy crops. Miscanthus, for example, is a tall cane type of grass and it grows from a rhizome and it grows very fast. It, it, it needs no fertiliser, it needs no spray, there's no um, other than if it's a thin crop and you need to spray Roundup to keep it clean. But if you, if you had a proper crop, it needs no fungicide, herbicide or insecticide. There's no insect that attacks it, nothing eats it, you know. So it's, and you don't have to re-sow it, like it was a perfect crop. This is carbon, okay? Mm-hmm. So we're looking at a carbon stick there, okay? Yeah. You can see it's, this, the bottom of it is quite sturdy, yeah. okay? Um, so that carbon, that was carbon dioxide in the atmosphere last year um, that was released from some source. So this is pure carbon dioxide now in the form of carbon. And when you burn that, carbon dioxide is released again but next year's crop ca- captures the carbon again so every year whereas oil is carbon that was grown on the planet a few million years ago and when you release it into the atmosphere it won't be back again for another few million years so this does the whole thing in one year do you know how much energy like we would produce yeah is it an efficient energy producer it, it is um without getting too technical about it uh, a trailer load, we'll say a silo trailer load, is about the equivalent of a tank of oil, your home heating tank of oil, you know. Um, and this field here, this is my best yielding field, it does 2.7 trailer loads uh, per acre. So that'll give you a rough idea. Willow is another energy crop that has nice attributes like miscanthus. Barry Castlin from Chogask. You can take local sewage sludge or maybe from a sewage treatment plant and that can be put back onto a crop of willow, which solves a local waste problem. Which, and you're also adding fertility to the willow, which can be used for local heat projects. Mm. It is at a local level that energy crop growers like Bill Madigan could see a future, which Barry Castlin can still envisage. It would require a whole new way of working and needs a lot of new infrastructure like local depots for trading biomass and making it available to the consumer. You'll see something like biomass trade centres developing right across Ireland, strategically located to supply end users within a short 20, 30 kilometre radius. And that would be mobilising the local pulpwood that would be coming from forestry, maybe local straw, um, maybe developing pellets out of miscanthus, maybe um, chip out of, out of willow. Uh, it could be forest for fibre. It could be uh, like a poplar eucalyptus, those types of trees that could be used that grow fairly fast as well and can provide uh, pulpwood or f- uh, fibre in a short sp- a period of time. But most of all, the energy crops need boilers to generate the heat, which would mean the development of large-scale boilers for towns and villages. Uh, You know, it could be one boiler heating, you know, a a town like Carlow or maybe the uh, hotels in Kilkenny or somewhere like that that would be supplying the heat to the larger businesses. Um, 
maybe to, to swimming pools and to le leisure centres and nursing homes or hospitals. That's the ideal route for it. And you could have a loop going through a town that it, where all that heat is uh, is being teed off to, and they're being charged per kilowatt hour of heat that's, that that they're receiving. In the same way, as they're being charged at the moment per kilowatt hour of heat coming from oil or gas. This kind of initiative needs joined up thinking across every part of the community and lots of support. There the challenges is, I suppose, getting the end user to realise that it makes sense for them to change over from their current fossil fuel to biomass, that they'll reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, all public service buildings has to reduce, they're required to reduce their emissions and also increase their renewable deployment. So it makes a lot of sense to explore this and maybe to team up with maybe local farmers who can supply the feedstocks because if you're to have confidence if you're going to change your building over from oil coal or gas and you're going to decide to use biomass you want to be confident that there's a supply chain in your immediate area that can supply you with the quality and quantity of material that you need to keep your boiler going for the hours that's needed you want to be also sure that there's a technology there that can i suppose reduce the amount of work Required the labour requirement for in terms of managing the the boiler, you know that the ash afterwards can be taken away, and there are different types of energy supply companies that do that kind of stuff. That they come in, they will supply the feedstock to you. They'll take away the ash, put that ash back onto the harvested crop of willow or onto the harvested crop of uh, straw or uh, oats or barley or, or wheat, whatever it may be. Um, so I think those models are there and we've, we see them right across Europe where they've already evolved and where they're already working. Bill would have seen all this sort of thing working in countries he visited in the process of setting up Kilogen. Now he's decided to get into the dairy cows, but he'll do it in a green way. The greenness is probably in us even anyway, so um, we uh, have an arrangement with, with an anaerobic digester. There's a local anaerobic digester over in Balatoban and all the manure from here will go into the anaerobic digester and we'll get back the... We're doing it already, getting back the digestate, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so in itself, like, that's that gas then could be fed into the grid and so on. But this is another of these grandiose plans. And here, once again, Bill can highlight deficiencies and inefficiencies in Ireland's overall plans for reducing our carbon emissions and dependence on fossil fuels. We're feeding the anaerobic digester in Ballet open, um, and he's producing the gas with it. But there's no way for him to get that gas into the grid. It doesn't exist right now. And he could, he has an engine down there with a the generator on it, which could be driven with the gas and feed it into the grid through electricity but he's no grid connection and the ESB won't give him a grid connection you know so like there's no giant up thinking and you know we're talking green and but it's all pie in the sky like here we are in the middle of a field of miscanthus about to plow it up you know that's the reality of it on the ground and down the road the guy has an engine connected up to an anaerobic digester turned off that's the reality of it Ireland is like I think really only plain lip service to the whole green energy thing but in Ireland we have to do something about this and Barry Castlin from Chalkisk is determined that we will the public genuinely see this as being a major issue that climate change needs to be tackled that even though we're small here in Ireland we still have a role to play in the overall global picture we have to be seen to be doing our part as well as a result of the support scheme for renewable heat I think we're going to see a massive demand for biomass in this country now we can continue to import it, uh, as we are importing coal from Colombia or oil from Norway or Saudi Arabia and all over the world. But we can grow biomass in this country better than any other country. And we have the ability to get very, very high yields. We export over 90% of our beef to other countries and, and, and dairy products right across the world. But we import over 90% of our energy we're spending over four billion a year on imported energy so if we can create markets for farmers that they can supply energy to businesses here in ireland that could encourage uh, from a rural development point of view as well rural businesses uh, to locate in a rural area because they can know they can get their heat supply locally uh, at a guaranteed uh, quality and quantity to meet their needs i think that, that type of uh, development is going to be very, very exciting for rural areas in the future. 
Down and Dirty on the Farm was produced by Monica Hayes and funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with a television licence fee.